Okay, and so now we are recording. So if anybody out there would also like to have a uh, recording of this webinar, you just email me and let me know. I'll make this recording available to anybody who would like to have it. So uh, it's kind of nice to be able to share. Um, so, all right, people are hopping on. So uh, welcome to our lunch hour uh, Confluence e-salon, as we're calling it. Uh, so this is just an opportunity for uh, you all to see Rachel's work. Rachel has been, uh, well, Rachel Tenelock is a Boise-based uh, landscape painter, artist. She has been an artist, I think a lifelong artist, uh, really been doing this professionally for about 19 years now. And Rachel approached us well, two years ago, I think we started talking about this project uh, with the idea uh, she was really inspired by um, salmon and salmon habitat and the work that we're doing to protect those things and, and you know, really trying to um, save salmon from the brink of extinction, which is where we are right now. The salmon runs, the salmon returns are really abysmal this year and they have been for the last, um, for, for a while now. And uh, so this art project is sort of an opportunity for us to connect viewers through the heart um, and really kind of give people an opportunity to, to feel um, a sense of place and connection to where salmon, uh, where they dwell and then the, the vast spans that they cover from central Idaho, the Stanley River Basin, all the way to the mouth of the Columbia River, the Pacific Ocean. It's really an impressive journey and Rachel has taken it uh, to a new level by painting um, scenes along the way of the uh, salmon migration route. And so that is what the Confluence Project is all about. And a portion of the proceeds of this uh, show, whether it's prints or uh, original artworks, will go toward Advocates for the West's work to protect salmon and salmon habitat. So we are deeply grateful to you for that, Rachel. Thank you so much. Um, and uh, so, once Rachel is done talking about her artwork, um, Lizzie Potter, who is a staff attorney at Advocates for the West in our Portland office, um, who's obviously working from home as we all are now, uh, she has been with Advocates for the West for about five years now and uh, works primarily on special places. Uh, she does a lot of work in Oregon, but also in, in other states around the West. Um, she's got some really great work going on in uh, California at Point Reyes and uh, has been working really hard on the Willamette River Basin, Oregon, uh, which is also salmon work, but she'll be talking primarily today about our Columbia and Snake River salmon uh, based work. And uh, before coming to us, she worked a lot on Clean Water Act issues. Um, so we're really, really happy to have Lizzie on our staff and it's, it's great to be able to introduce you to everybody. So. Um, with that, I am going to hand it over to Rachel and I'm going to pull up her website. I'm going to do a screen share so you can all see her paintings. Give me just a second here. Hi everybody. Thanks for joining. Hi mom. <laughs> My mom is on. Um, okay. You just go down to gallery. Um, and then Let's just see, I'll go there. Yeah. Okay. Um, and maybe start, um, it doesn't really matter, um, but let's start at the last image on the bottom. Down here? Uh-huh. Okay. All right, and then we can just go backwards through them as we scroll. Okay, how would you like me to scroll just as you're, as you're talking? Uh -oh. Yeah, I'll, I'll cue you to. Okay, scroll. sounds good. <laughs> so, um, yeah, so I'm really excited to be able to share this project and um, I wanna thank advocates for being so supportive um, I mean, it, it sounds like we both feel lucky to be working with each other. So um, I guess that's a good partnership, but um, I, I'm really happy that they can use my imagery and we can raise a little bit of money and um, we can connect people who follow my work with people who follow theirs and um, hopefully just get some more uh, awareness of the issue and inspiration for people to, to step back. And I think it's becoming clear that the most important work we can do for the environment is to undo the harm that we've done. <laughs> the nature doesn't really need us. We just, they just need, it just needs us to, to get out of the way and let the, the cycles that are supposed to happen, happen um, well. So anyway, um, with my work, I guess I feel like that idea of undoing is what gives me meaning right now for continuing to create these, these objects that are taking resources also, but hopefully um, some of these projects will create more 
um, good, then they use resources. Um, this is the only uh, painting so far that has an actual salmon in it. And I didn't take this photo myself. This photo was from um, Anna's mother. It was awesome that I was able to use it. Um, I was asking for photos of salmon to, to work from since I'm not a fisherman or a river person. Um, and I was getting a lot of, of caught salmon from fishermen and those are awesome, but this was important to me to get a live um, salmon who's making its way up the river. So that's this one. And I, I kind of went crazy with my bold, um, like un, unfeathered brush strokes here and got a lot of rainbow stripes in there with the multiple colors on the brush. Um, and I wanted to kind of convey the, the chaos and magnitude of the river and then the salmon just really focused and on his journey. So, okay, go ahead, Anna. Um, Mount Hood, this is from the, um, let's see, where is this from? So just, just back behind town on one of the Forest Service roads. And I actually took the image for this last spring um, and got a glimpse of the mountain. I was hoping to get some more imagery um, um, myself, but again, I borrowed a photo to, to do a, a, another larger piece than this one, but this was just a little study of the mountain. So go ahead. Um, so this is the first one I did with the orca whales and um, partway through the last few months, we realized that the, or I realized maybe that the collection needed to include the whales and just as a representative of all the different ecosystems and species that the salmon um, health uh, on which that depend on the salmon health. So this is also borrowed from a, a wildlife photographer that, that um, allowed me to use her images. And this is around Friday Harbor in um, on San Juan Island. So this, uh, this painting is of the Hanford Reach and it's kind of funny that um, one of my past phases of life came back and um, became part of my present with this part of the project. It's not directly, you know, along the Salmon River and where we're, where um, the route that we were specifically targeting is, but this is the last of the free flowing Columbia up um, above the Tri-Cities. And a childhood friend of mine who I did gymnastics with, her grandfather, um, Rich Steele, was the champion for um, getting this created as a national monument and helping to protect the the water and the hillsides, which are um, really suffering from sloughing from um, agri agriculture. So here's the Hanford Reach, and um, this was a beach that we got up to as he gave us a tour on his on his um, aluminum fishing boat. And Amy Moran was with us, and so was um, Sirsha, my daughter, who was about two months old at the time, so that was really fun. Okay, go ahead. So Brackish, I did this one um, a couple, probably two years ago when we first started this, this project. And my mom and I took a trip to Astoria, Oregon with my older daughter, spent a few days there. And this is Brackish, this is where the Columbia meets the Pacific. So a really beautiful beach. Um, of a mix of salty and fresh water. Okay, go ahead. Here's another orca. And, um, I'll, I'll find out, I forget the name of the photographer right now. Anna, maybe you can pipe in. Heather McIntyre, I think. Um, but yes, she was, right. yeah, um, yes. <laughs> I, would, I can double check for you, but I believe. <laughs> yeah, but she's just, uh, she's a really great um, nature photographer and environmental activist. Um, she does, she, I think she's in Texas, or at least I talked to her, last time I talked to her, she was in Texas um, working um, to, to help with um, horses that were being slaughtered, wild horses. Um, and she knows the name of each of these whales. It's really neat. So go ahead. So this is some, some of the paintings I included in the project as prints are some older work. Um, and this was actually a commission by a local school, school teacher whose family used to vacation on Wallace Island back when it was a private island. Her family of school teachers owned it with other school teachers and the five families would go spend their summers on Wallace Island, which is in um, British Columbia. 
All right, go ahead. This is also up in that area. This is San Juan Island. And one of the possible locations for one of the confluence shows is with the family of the little girl standing up on the hillside. Her name's Ada. And we visited them a couple of years ago. So here's another painting where it fit in really nicely with the collection, but it wasn't specifically painted for it. This is one of my favorites, I think. It's called Columbia Meets the Pacific. Um, yeah, and again, um, brackish water around Astoria. Fort, Fort Stevens State Park, I think is where that is. Um, I don't know if I need to say anything about this. Most of us know this view um, from Sawtooth Valley of the Sawtooths. Uh, here's an earlier one, as was that Stanley one. I think I did this in about, oh yeah, so it's 2000, 2014. Um, yeah, it's just a view of Redfish Lake and the Satyas Mountains. I'll just throw in there for the, I'm sure folks know this, but um, just as a reminder that Redfish Lake is called Redfish Lake because of the uh, salmon returns that used to go up there uh, and are no longer uh, which is, you know, I think a really important reminder um, as to the, the critical nature of this work. You know, I mean, here we have a place that's called Redfish Lake that has no redfish in it any longer. I mean, you know, Lonesome Larry, for those who've heard the le legend of Lonesome Larry, the sole sockeye salmon who made it up to Redfish Lake several years ago, um, only to find that there were no mates for him. So, um, I think it's great that you included this piece in, in the collection because it's such a, it's such an important part of the story. So. Yeah, and um, my, our family's personal connection to it is my husband Sean's family lived at Redfish for I think three summers his, in a Volkswagen van. His dad was working for MK and uh, in Chalice and they would just, the family would just camp in the van for the summer. And um, yeah, even then he remembers seeing the, the salmon there and not now, so. Um, Rachel, did you see that question from Jan? Um, oh yeah. Um, oh, thanks. Yeah, I can. <laughs> I can definitely talk about uh, materials. So, would Rachel say a bit about the artistic technique of oil and wax on linen? Um, so, lin the linen is, you know, as opposed to canvas, it just has a little bit finer um, tooth to it. It's a thinner, um, a thinner fabric just has a really lovely texture. And I work on two different kinds of linen, either a pre-primed, pre which is coated with a clear acrylic coating, um, or I, I buy the um, raw linen and um, prime it myself. And that gives it a, it has a toothier texture to it. Um, but either way, I'm working with that kind of grayish, warm gray color of the linen, which I like to start with some sort of color besides white. I used to paint a lot of my panels red which you can see in this Redfish Lake painting that has a red panel. It's painted on a red panel. Um, I'm not sure what it says, but it is a red panel. Um, so it's a little smoother. You can see how smooth the water is at the bottom. Um, and the little bits of red that you see peeking through the trees is just where I did thinner strokes of paint and also in the willows. Um, so yeah, I used to work a little bit more on, on panels too. And, and right now I'm working pretty much exclusively on linen and also getting a little bit more into watercolors again because it's a little bit less material intensive and easier to travel with. Uh, the wax is a it's sort of like a Vaseline um, consistency. It comes as a, it's a wax paste. So it's wax, beeswax emulsified in um, walnut oil. So it's like melted down into the oil and it stays um, pasty that way. And I mix that in with my paint while it's wet along with a little bit more uh, walnut oil. And I don't use any turpentine or paint thinner. I use the oil as my th as my thinner. So um, all natural mix-ins with the paint. Thanks, Rachel. And I, as you were talking, I realized that um, I I want to make sure people know uh, a little bit about uh, what it means to be a plein air artist as well. If you want to talk a little bit about your actual process and method, because I think it's a really beautiful way to connect with nature. Yeah, well, um, I don't know if any of the larger pieces you see here are actually plein air. Um, I used to be a very purist plein air painter, which a lot of plein air painters are. There's a really big difference between working from studying something um, 
in 3D than from a photograph. When, when just the obvious is that everything's flattened for you already in a photograph and time is held still. So you don't have the challenges of both the perspective and, and flattening a three-dimensional object in your mind, um, as well as trying to figure out how to keep up with the light or not, <laughs> just how to, to deal with that changing element. Um, so I do love plein air painting and I do it when I can, but it's not always possible to do a large piece outside. Um, and also since I've had kids, the morning and the evening hours that are really good for plein air painting are also a little bit more intensive for parenting. So I've become more of an in-studio painter for the larger pieces. And that's, I like that process too. It helps me like really study the image and do something bigger and focus on technique of painting versus just hurrying, hurrying and capturing the image. But I also really still um, value painting a location on site. So um, a lot of you might know about my Tiny Expanse project where I do a painting every day on site. And a lot of the times that will be like on research trips to take pictures for bigger paintings. So it's really nice to have experienced a landscape and, and observed it uh, on site and gone through that flattening process from real life before I go into the studio and do it from a photograph. Which is that whole explanation is why I prefer, prefer to work from my own photographs and I rarely ask others for photos to work from, um, but sometimes I have to. So this one, um, this is also probably a familiar view for many people. It's like a little bit down from low, from um, Upper Stanley, you know, before you get to Lower Stanley, looking up at the Sawtooths along the Salmon River, which is so glassy and smooth there in the winter, at least at this moment it was, that it looks a little bit like a lake. And those are just frozen, it's, you know, frozen surface water along the highway there. This is one, I think this was the first painting that I did specifically as an, um, a confluence piece. Um, and I, I like this one a lot. It's one that I did quickly and I usually like paintings that I've done quickly the most because it sort of feels like it was inspired. Right? I was in the groove at the moment. Um, you can see the flat brushwork in the willows um, with lots of different variation in color where I have different colors on the brush at the same time. I'm doing very little mixing on the palette. This is early in the morning from um, near the fish, fish hatchery. Um, let's see. Yeah, and my mom will remember driving from Ketchum early in the morning to take these pictures and then going for breakfast at the Sawtooth Bakery for pancakes. Um, but yeah. So this is near Riggins. Um, that last light in the in a s steep canyon that just gets so dramatic, lighting up the um, the hillside. And that was on my way up to doing this painting. <laughs> uh, this next one, which was for Lynn Lahi, um, on the Lock Saw, and we drove the whole corridor and took about two hundred photos. And some of them were of trying to select a. a uh, location to do a painting for him from advocates and for his retirement from the board. Um, and this one was like kind of an inconspicuous mile. There was some more famous or iconic ones that I considered, but I liked that this was, this just could, kind of could have been anywhere along the Loxa. Yeah, and for those of you who uh, don't know Lynn, Lynn was a longtime board member. He was our board president for several years and uh, really incredible guy, um, works works tirelessly to advocate for salmon and salmon recovery. And he lived along the Locksaw, right along this mile marker, I believe, um, for many, many years with his wife, Borg. And uh, he's up in Moscow now, just recently retired from our board. Uh, but it was a, really a deep honor to be able to commission Rachel to um, create this work for Lynn and um, in honor of all the work that he's done for us. And so I, this is really special. I'm happy to see this one as part of the collection. Thanks, Rachel. Sure. Now this one was fun. We, it was our first camping trip with our baby 
she was a month old and um, we drove like a thousand miles <laughs> in a weekend or three days. But we stopped along the way at Friends of Lindenborg's to ask more about locations that, that they had loved. Um, but mostly what we found out was that they loved it all and I couldn't really go wrong with whatever I picked to do. So um, yeah, a lot of people along that way were um, excited to, to help me out. So this one's called Headwaters. This is the headwaters of, it almost the headwaters of the Salmon River. You'd have to go a little further up the trail. Um, yeah, there's beautiful, beautiful um, stream in Sasuth Valley. Um, so this is the co confluence of the Selway and the Loxaw. So that, that was um, done from research along that trip uh, for Lynn's painting. So here's the, one of the three or four paintings I did in the series that was from another person's photo. So thank you to Anna's family for offering that to me. Um, a real dramatic like thunderstorm with sun rays coming through over the, over the river at um, Hood River. And um, so this is the Palouse. And I know that this is a little bit of a, of a sidetrack from the Salmon River, um, but it was a landscape I haven't really ever painted in Idaho, and I was going to be having a show first in June and then in September, and hopefully still in September, up in Moscow. Um, and we went and camped for a weekend on Kamiak Butte and just got some sunrise and sunset views. So here's the, the super green, I think this was in April or May, maybe early May. So beautiful landscape. I think we're, oh, I think there's one more. It's, um, it was, okay, hang on. There's another Hanford one. Okay, let me see. Maybe um, relo reload your screen, because I just added that one before our conversation. Oh, okay. There we go. There. So one, last, uh, one last Hanford Reach one. I really want to do this one because Rich Steele really loves the rock bars like gravel rock bars in the middle of the Columbia River. So I wanted to make sure I got one of those in. So this one. That's beautiful. Oh, it's cool. I, I didn't realize there was one I hadn't seen yet. <laughs> yeah. And I think I forgot to say I actually lived there along the Columbia for two years in eighth and ninth grade. My dad was working at the Hanford site. So um, a little ironic part of the Hanford Reach is that area remained empty because of the um, nuclear um, facilities there. Um, I'll pop back in. Oh, hello. Uh, so thank you so much, Rachel. Um, this has been, oh, look, I was able to zoom in on it. Um, <laughs> <laughs> unintentionally, uh, I'm going to stop sharing for a real quick second. And, um, then it looks like we just had that one question on the artwork from Jan. I'm going to hand it over to Lizzie, who's going to talk about our salmon work. Um, and again, as uh, folks have questions, please feel free to hit that Q&A button and um, submit your questions to Lizzie for anything that you want to know about our work. Um, Lizzie, I'm going to go ahead and pull that map up for you and then uh, take it away. Let's see. Well, thanks so much. Um, as Anna's doing that, you know, part of the reason why we love our partnership with Rachel so much is because she understands the importance of working uh, from the mouth of the Columbia up into the headwaters. So for those of you who aren't familiar with some of the landscape that she was highlighting through her photos, um, you know, they really trace, if you, if you look over on the left side of the map, the Columbia River estuary sort of in the middle, um, you know, that, that's the mouth of the Columbia where the fish go out and, uh, you know, do their, do their journey to get big and, and fat and then come back up through the mouth and wind their way through. You can see um, if you zoom in, but the, the blocks, the, oh yeah, you have the pointer, Anna. Uh, it looks like the, um, the dams in the middle of the, the photo, the, yeah, Bonneville, the Dalles, John Day, these little blocks in the middle there. The salmon have to make it up through this massive series of dams and then through the red ones, Ice Harbor, Lower Monumental, Little Goose, Lower Granite, all the way 
can you you're not hearing me very well um paul it looks like anna yeah. can others hear me okay i can hear you fine right or uh, lizzie but um i don't know paul i wonder if it's your connection all right well, i will keep going okay madeline says she can hear fine so i'll keep going um sorry about that paul um so anyway right it's a big tough migration that these salmon have to get all the way back to some of those beautiful pristine headwaters where they spawn and complete their impressive journey um, uh, largely up in in idaho and so uh, for a couple of decades now advocates for the west has been working to protect uh, salmon during its various stages of its migration cycle. I think historically Advocates is really focused on some of that uh, habitat work up in the high reaches of Idaho, the sawtooth that Rachel highlighted near Redfish Lake, because one of the, the travesties of, of the salmon migration journey is they've, they've survived this gauntlet of dams and then they get back to these beautiful mountain headwaters to complete their journey where oftentimes they get literally stepped on by cattle that are running on public lands um, you know habitat spawning streams that have been destroyed by diversion dams things like that and so advocates for the west has historically done a lot of work to address those habitat issues in idaho more recently over the last several years we've really turned our focus to looking at this river system that you can see, the Columbian Snake River Basin, um, thinking about river restoration as a whole. Because with climate change and other threats to salmon, um, we don't have time to wait to protect these fish. They are on their last legs, and if we don't do something soon, we may lose them forever. And so we love Rachel's work because she also takes this holistic region-wide view um, to tracing the, the path of the salmon on this journey. Um, so today I just want to talk briefly about some of our work throughout the, the basin to um, address some of the harm that's coming to these salmon and steelhead from dams. We have cases, current cases, that are working to address the harm from more than about a dozen, two dozen dams. Um, we just won a massive victory, a precedent setting victory, both in the legal realm and in the salmon realm over lethally hot temperatures in the Columbia and Snake Rivers. So if you're not familiar with one of the big problems that salmon face today, let me tell you about that. And that is these, these dams, starting with the Bonneville and the Dalles and the John Day, going up through those lower snake dams that I mentioned before, these dams create these big reservoirs that slow down the water and allow solar radiation to heat everything up. And so what happens is salmon get, you know, normally they want to migrate pretty quickly up and down these big corridors and get to cool refugia in the summertime um, on some of the tributaries. But when they get through, when they have to go through this main stem area in the Columbia and then into the Snake River, they get stuck in these hot reservoirs um, that in recent years are getting so hot that they're, they're you know, pretty quickly lethal to the salmon. In the summer of 2015, which if you remember was brutal for, for everyone uh, in terms of the heat, uh, hundreds of thousands of salmon died because of the heat. And so we crafted a very creative lawsuit to force the Environmental Protection Agency to finally release a plan that will require the Army Corps of Engineers to address these lethally hot temperatures coming from the reservoir. Um, we just uh, a few months ago had the Ninth Circuit on Bonk, even with a slate of new Trump appointees, uphold the victory and uh, EPA has finally released that plan. Um, it may take a few years to actually implement it through some other creative advocacy with our partners, um, but we are uh, really excited about this win because um, those lethally hot temperatures and addressing the problems of the reservoirs are vital to ensuring the survival and recovery of these salmon. So that's one example of our recent work. Um, another really uh, fascinating case that we're working on, we're, we're very honored to represent the Nez Perce tribe in a case against the state of Oregon over water quality and fish passage impacts to salmon and steelhead on the Snake River in the Hell's Canyon area. 
um, it's, it's kind of hard to see on this map, um, but the Hell's Canyon dams completely block fish passage, get fish passage on the Snake River getting up um, above those dams and into Idaho. And it's, it's just so sad because there is so much habitat above those dams um, that fish haven't been able to access in decades. And this has caused irreparable injury to the tribe, its citizens, um, and, and others who rely on these fish, um, you know, for, for, various, uh, for various purposes. And so, um, you know, we, the state of Oregon, through negotiations with Idaho Power Company, who owns and operates those dams, um, provided what's called a water quality certification um, that basically will allow the dams to operate for uh, another generation to come, decades, if um, decades that without actually ever requiring fish passage and improvements, meaningful improvements to the water quality problems there, which include not just the hot temperatures that I was talking about, but also there's a really serious mercury problem that's, that's complicated scientifically, but it is um, because of the dams, the way that they're set up on that river, uh, you know, very dangerous levels of mercury are accumulating in the water and then in the fish. And that threatens the health of the fish populations and the people who consume them. And so, um, you know, that, that case is ongoing, so I, I, I can't really mention much about it, but other than just to say, um, it's, a, it's a huge honor for, for us at Advocates to, for the West um, to represent the Nez Perce tribe in this important litigation to create, uh, that's aimed at remedying harm that stemmed, um, you know, from the construction and operation of these dams on their Aboriginal homeland. Here in Oregon, um, we've been working on, so the Willamette River is a, is a major tributary. Uh, if you kind of go to the left of the map in Portland, then you look down. Um, the Willamette, like the Snake, is, is one of the biggest tributaries to the Columbia River. Um, so the Snake and the Willamette, these two, two rivers that we're, we're focused on, you know, again, thinking about a regional level, uh, the Willamette is the main river in Oregon. Um, for those of you who aren't Oregonians or haven't spent much time here, the Willamette is the lifeblood of Western Oregon. Most of the people in the state live within the Willamette Valley, um, and the Willamette cuts through the heart of Oregon or through the heart of Portland. And there, but there are only two native Salmonid populations that um, use the Willamette River and then up into the upper Willamette tributaries. But unfortunately, uh, like most of the rivers in this region, uh, where there are wonderful salmon populations, we have major federal dams here. So bottom left of the corner, you can see um, several of those dams from Big Cliff, Detroit, Green Peter, Foster, Cougar. Um, there is this series of really high head dams there. Some of them are hundreds of feet tall and uh, very close together. And they completely, many of them completely block fish passage for the Chinook salmon and winter steelhead um, that historically used the spawning grounds above those, um, above those dams. And it has absolutely decimated the salmon populations there. Both the Willamette and the Snake River populations that some of our cases are focused on are among the most threatened in across the West Coast. Um, I mean, both the Snake, some of the Snake River populations and the Willamette populations are really hanging on by just a thread. And so this was, uh, you know, a classic case of the Army Corps of Engineer not engineers not paying attention to their obligations under the Endangered Species Act for for quite a long time. And so um, we were able to investigate for more than a year and put together a lawsuit and a coalition to finally try to hold the Army Corps of Engineers accountable for the irreparable harm that it's causing to these salmon species. Um, you know, we've we've had some success immediately in the case. Um, the Corps agreed with us that it needed to what's called reinitiate consultation under the Endangered Species Act and create a new plan that will hopefully put these, these fish on a path to recovery. Um, we're currently waiting for a decision on the merits of the remaining issues in the case, um, but it's been a really exciting case here in Oregon to make sure that we don't lose the only native salmon species that we have that use the Willamette, um, the upper Willamette River Basin. Um, and I just, you know, I think I'll end my talk on uh, 
some of our dam work. We're, we're, doing, we're doing a lot of things. We've got a lot of interesting irons in the fire. We're working with really fascinating partners. Um, you know, we, we're a law firm, we're a nonprofit law firm. And so we provide our services for free to conservation groups, um, you know, who are helping us come up with legal, innovative legal strategies to help spur the political reform that's going to be necessary to get um, in particular, the Lower Snake River dams out. Um, you're, you're probably familiar with a lot of that advocacy. Um, you know, it's been, it's been happening for, for a number of years, um, but I think we finally have some, some serious momentum due to, sadly, the, um, the really uh, terrible shape that those fish are in. And so we're only able to do this work thanks to the support of people like Rachel um, and, and many of you. I think about the hundreds of hours that we spent digging in on our Willamette case, for example, um, before we you know, had, had a case to bring. And we're only able to do that because of um, you know, the investments that, that you all make in us and that allow us to uh, you know, really dig into the problems that, that need solving um, in, in this basin. And so uh, I think with that, it looks like there might be a couple of questions. Um, uh, but yeah, it's just quite an honor to, to work with Rachel um, because like I, you know, as I mentioned just briefly, I'll say again, uh, legal strategies are really important, um, but this, this really will take a village and a community to solve, um, to solve these problems. We need, uh, you know, to put the pressure on our elected officials, um, you know, and, and rally the community to get the support we need to get those lower Snake River dams out. Um, and and save these salmon before it's too late. Thank you so much, Lizzie. Um, I actually wanted to uh, throw in there to give folks an idea of of uh, how well salmon populations can rebound. And I don't know if you can speak much to this, but I've been really inspired to hear about how well the rogue is doing um, and the fish populations. In fact, that that picture that. Uh, Rachel painted that salmon from uh, that my stepmother took uh, is from the Rogue, and it's it was a um, a run that came up after the dams were removed off the tributaries. And um, I, I mean, if you don't know a lot about it, like no pressure to talk about it, but I I think it's pretty interesting that you know once those dams are removed, that the fish will return. So there is hope, right? It, yeah, it's pretty incredible. The um, I can't speak to the Rogue River success in any detail, but I can to the Elwha River restoration. I don't know if any of you followed that, but that was the largest river restoration project to ever occur, I think, in the world um, uh, when it happened, when those dams came out on the Olympic Peninsula. You can see in the top upper left corner, um, you can't, the Elwha River isn't on there, but um, that was a massive victory getting those dams out. And it I, my understanding is it blew away even the scientists who predicted success there, how quickly the salmon populations returned, sped right past the former dam sites, recolonized their old spawning grounds and, and rebounded um, like no one, no one predicted. Uh, and the river itself healed uh, very quickly. I've, there's some pretty incredible time-lapse photos if you haven't seen them at the mouth of um, at the mouth of the Elwha River watching the sediment and the beaches uh, and the estuaries quickly restore and you know again bringing it back to how important Rachel's spotlighting of the um, you know the mouth to headwaters portions of this um, you know river systems are, are living breathing organisms in, in their own right and by restoring the beaches it not only helped the salmon but I, my understanding is that the birds uh, you know, and other wildlife uh, also quickly rebounded and, you know, started to find that balance that used to happen there. Um, and I think people are very hopeful that similar things could happen in the Lower Snake uh, River context. I think the Willamette and the Hell's Canyon complex, um, those are much more difficult solutions. Um, uh, dam removal is, is a much more tricky uh, situation there, but um, I guess one other thing I'll say on that, if you haven't already, I would encourage you to read uh, the call of the Yakima Nation for the removal of the, uh, the actual, the main stem Columbia River dams. There's been so much talk on the lower Snake River dams, um, but the truth is all the dams on the Columbia are 
um, you know, really pose an existential threat to those salmon populations there. So if you're, if you're looking for some good reading, I'd recommend the Elwha Restoration Project and the, the calls for the removal of the dams in the Columbia. Thank you. Um, we're to doing a, a confluence too. That's like an elegy to the dams. <laughs> yeah, let's let's hope that that is something that can happen. <laughs> I think that's a good thing to strive for. Um, I the only so I don't see any other questions for you guys. Just a comment from Larry saying the salmon used to run all the way to Nevada upstream of Hell's Canyon, which is, I mean, they they are they're. God, incredibly Im impressive fish. It's so, it's such a charismatic species. It's such a keystone species, you know? I mean, this is really, um, this is you know, part of what makes the West so special and unique. And so it's really an honor to, um, to kind of have these, these ideas coalescing here, you know, the, the art that shows the the special beauty of these places and then um, you know the legal work that we do at Advocates for the West to make sure that those special places can remain beautiful and remain um, you know pristine habitat for for salmon and steelhead um, you know I mean these these upper reaches in the Stanley River Basin are some of the best remaining salmon spawning habitat um, that there is and so we just need to get them there um, and that is you know, that's what we're working toward. There's a big go coalition of groups that are out there working on this, um, on this very issue. And we are really glad to be uh, the legal arm behind a lot of that case work. Um, so thanks, Lizzie, for the great work you do and all of our attorneys at Advocates for the West. And Rachel, thank you so much for bringing this beauty to life with your paintings and, and sharing that with us. It's such an honor. Um, and, you know, and thank you all for supporting this work. I mean, this is really, you know, we can't do it without you. So we are really appreciative of all the folks out there who um, help make our work possible. And, um, you know, through Confluence Project, you can make that work possible and also have gorgeous artwork in your house. So, I mean, what's not to love about that? Um, I know that Rachel is also working on putting together a book that will contain all of this artwork and um, some, uh, we're going to put some language together for that book. I'm excited to work with you on that, Rachel. And, um, you know, so there will be many opportunities to experience and explore Confluence. Um, those of you who are in the Boise area, please join us on Saturday, the 25th. That's this coming Saturday, day after tomorrow. Um, in Garden City at the little uh, 34th Street Marketplace, we will have the entire Confluence series there and you can come and check it out yourselves. Um, we will have hand sanitizer, masks are required, social distancing will be enforced um, with a friendly smile behind masks. Uh, we'll work on smiling with our eyes and waving, you know, all that air fist bumps, whatever you want. Um, we would just be really happy to see you. So, oh, and there my dog is gonna go. Oh, the pleasures of working from home. Um, <laughs> I think the mailman just showed up. I mean, Lucy. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to mute myself so you don't have to listen to her bark. <laughs> All right. Well, thanks, everybody. We really appreciate uh, you joining us today. And so on behalf of Advocates for the West, I can't echo enough what uh, Anna said. Buy some of Rachel's artwork. Put it up in your homes. Um, and when you can safely bring people into it, uh, into your home, show them, show them her artwork and talk about the importance of protecting the Columbia and Snake River basins from its headwaters to uh, the Columbia River estuary. And thanks to advocates and um, my supporters and advocate supporters for all your uh, enthusiasm for this project. Yeah, thank you all. And you know, you can always go to, uh, it's tenelock-confluenceproject.com, right? Mm -hmm. or, yeah, or from my main website, tenelock.com, um, you can just follow the link. Yep. And you can get more information on advocateswest.org as well. Um, thank you all so much for joining us. I will send out, uh, I had a request for the recording of this uh, webinar and for the map that you see on the screen right now. So I can send that out um, afterward and uh, please feel free to share it with your friends and family. Um, all right. Till next time, everybody. Thanks so much. Bye. Bye.